Thank you for tuning in to Strange Studies of Strange Stories. The following podcast is from our original show, the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast, which ran over 600 episodes from 2009 to 2022, and is exactly the kind of thing you can expect from us here, albeit with an expanded focus on all the best in horror, science fiction, and fantasy. There's a new free episode every month, or subscribe at patreon.com slash witchhousemedia to get new shows every week. Thanks again, and enjoy. HPpodcraft.com. It is very seldom that mere ordinary people like John and myself secure ancestral halls for the summer. A colonial mansion, a hereditary estate. I would say a haunted house and reach the height of romantic felicity, but that would be asking too much of fate. Still, I will proudly declare that there is something queer about it. Else, why should it be let so cheaply? And why I have stood so long untenanted? John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in a marriage. John is practical in the extreme. He has no patience with faith, an intense horror of superstition, and he scoffs openly at any talk of things not to be felt and seen and put down in figures. John is a physician, and perhaps... I would not say it to a living soul, of course, but this is dead paper and a great relief to my mind. Perhaps... That is one reason I do not get well faster. You see, he does not believe I am sick. And what can one do? If a physician of high standing and one's own husband assures friends and relatives that there is really nothing the matter with one but temporary nervous depression, a slight hysterical tendency, what is one to do? My brother is also a physician and also of high standing, and he says the same thing. So I take phosphates, or phosphites, whichever it is, and tonics, and journeys, and air, and exercise, and am absolutely forbidden to work until I am well again. Personally, I disagree with their ideas. Personally, I believe that congenial work with excitement and change would do me good. But what is one to do? That was the opening of The Yellow Wallpaper, and you are listening to the H.P. Lovecraft Literary Podcast at hppodcraft.com. I'm Chris Lackey. And I am Chad Pfeiffer. As most of you know, we've been surveying some of the classic weird literature referenced by Lovecraft in his essay, Supernatural Horror and Literature. And, you know, Chris, many of the stories that are talked about in that essay are somewhat obscure or esoteric, or I have at least never heard of them before. Yeah. But this would probably be the most famous story we've covered you think it's more famous than uh the yellow sign <laughs> i think it might be slightly more famous than that yeah the yellow wallpaper is by charlotte perkins gilman is the author's name yes. um it's widely taught it's one that a lot of people have uh, had to read in college or in, in high school All oh, right right if i tell people that we're doing covering the story they know what i'm talking about oh okay, it's, it's rare to run into somebody who hasn't read it that said i did consider maybe we should call a scholar like a feminist literature professor or mm-hmm. Somebody from the Charlotte Perkins Gilman Society, uh, you know, help us oh, out yeah, and be idea. a guest. Yeah. But then I forgot to do that. <laughs> I um, Actually, at the end of the day, I really felt that the audience would probably get a more thorough and poignant analysis of this masterpiece of feminist literature if it was provided by two male horror nerds. That seemed like the yeah. best course of action. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah. Actually, I was talking to Ani DeFranco and she said that she would love to do it. And I said, uh, <laughs> no. Yeah, I had the same experience because, you know, Brooke Shields listens to the show and she was like, when you guys do the yellow wallpaper, totally have me on because she wrote that whole book on postpartum depression. Right, exactly. And I was just like, meh, meh. (laughs) Sorry, Brooke. It's all right, because while you can't not talk about the feminist concepts in the story, the yellow wallpaper really works as a weird tale. Oh, my God, Uh, yeah. In in the mold of what Lovecraft was talking about in supernatural horror and literature. So so even though we're going to touch on some of the, you know, the obvious feminist stuff that's going on in here, we really want to focus on how it works as a weird tale as well. I mean, it's actually cited in the introduction to Lovecraft's essay. Yeah. And uh, and he touches on it later in the work. It really nails the the weird. It's pretty awesome. And uh, I I just want to make a quick note. I'm uh, recording over at Innsmouth House Studio uh, Mm -hmm. over here. So if I sound a little bit better than normal, that's because I'm talking on. Uh, Paul of Cthulhu's magnificent microphone. Yeah, Paul McLean. He's in there with you in the room. Yeah. Well, no, he left. He, he's like, oh, he left. Yeah, he's gonna go party. 
Why does, he, why does he want to look at me just, you know, talking and only hearing half the conversation? It's See, so I just imagine he was sitting there cross-legged on the floor looking up at you just smiling. <laughs> <laughs> not, not right now. We uh, did have a, a woman on the show there in the beginning reading the intro yes, that was did. Heather Klinky, yes. my wife. She loves the story. And you know what? I do, too. I was really glad to come back to it and look at it again after all of the different weird tales that we've discussed and kind of think, thinking about it that way. I picked up on a lot of things that I didn't get to before. I, I have to be honest. I've never read this story before. I missed it. Oh, no kidding. Really? Yeah, man. I never read it. It's great. It's totally amazing. And it's a really good, weird tale. A bit sad. Well, right away, the protagonist describes the estate they're coming to as a haunted house. There's something queer about it. And it's unlikely that's the case but it was rented cheaply and has been empty for a long time. So there's a lot of things that are left up for interpretation in the story. You know, it's this is, again, the kind of thing we've got an unreliable narrator to an extent. Right. But we don't know that initially. You're right. We don't. So as far as we know right now, there is something weird about it. Yeah. But I think the story works on a, a couple of levels in that she could be right. Oh, yeah. This might actually be a haunted house. The most common interpretation of the story is that this is mostly happening in her head. Yeah. It could possibly be taken on the surface as well. But yeah, and some some of the stuff I've read also is that it's kind of an allegory for getting out of the yoke of the feminist oppressor, right. which I think is the most common interpretation of yeah. it. But the fact that the house was rented very cheaply and has been empty for a long time, and the way that they describe it as being this huge kind of ancestral home, yeah, you know, it kind of tees up a ghost story. That's that's you often yeah. you know that that in, in ghost stories that's often the way it is like oh nobody's old rented the old Johnson place <laughs> are you kidding I'll rent it I'm not afraid of any ghosts you know it's that kind <laughs> right of- and her husband does that uh, very well he's the, he is that that skeptic character that is often in most of these uh, supernatural stories where he, exactly. he doesn't believe in any of that stuff and he kind of dismisses his wife because she does or yeah. at least is is feeling that way now she's gone through some kind of experience or she's suffering from some sort of illness but we we don't know yet exactly what that is or what that's about we just know that her husband is a doctor yeah. and he's kind of decided what the best course of action for her is and it's going to be rest out in this home he's extremely patronizing and i mean that in the most basic sense of the word he's paternally controlling of her yeah he kind of treats her like a child exactly i thought it was funny when she said um well, not funny, but there's that brilliant sentence where she says, John laughs at me, of course, but one expects that in marriage. And <laughs> it like reveals everything about right. their relationship, you know, yeah. and also maybe what the expectations of this relationship of a relationship might be from the narrator. You know, it might reveal the attitudes of the time a little bit that, well, you know, once you get married, you're going to be kind of belittled a little bit. That's to be expected. Oh, horrible. In the excerpt that we heard to open it up, the the way it's broken up, yeah, it's really interesting writing style that she has. There's never more than one or two sentences in a paragraph, actually. yeah. So it's a lot of like short declarative sentences. I guess to mirror what a journal might be like, but it's it's really effective. Yeah, it's very economical the way the story's written. She doesn't waste a lot. But it's infuriating when she says, you know, I think stimulation of some sort would be good, but they've got me on this rest therapy, and knowing. As we know, when we get a little further on that she's having a a heavy clinical depression, it's infuriating because she's right. Like she needs to see people. She needs to be involved in things, not shut off from the world. (laughs) Put in a creepy room all by herself for a long time. And they don't even want her to write. No. And and her brother is also being a physician. They've both her her husband and her brother have both decided writing is even bad for you because that's going to make you think too much or something like that. Yeah, They don't really go into why that's bad for her. And so I was part of me wondered if there was something up with them. And they were trying to get rid of her at some point. I mean, it, that might be the case, too. Maybe he, he's got a lady on the side or something like that's going on. And he just kind yeah. of it, it kind of had a bit of a flowers in the attic sort of feeling for, for oh, me. Oh, totally. I, I, I was thinking that something was up like that early in the story as well, that he's but, definitely fooling around. Yeah, but it doesn't really pay out in any way. No. So I guess that was just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well... <laughs> She describes the estate a bit, and it does seem like a really beautiful place, but they've decided the best place for her to reside is up at the top floor. Which is in this old nursery. Yeah. And then it's it's really weird because it's the wallpaper, it's like Mm. falling apart and it's peeling and they, they put her in a really dingy, crummy room, it sounds like. And here's the thing, if you were going to take this from a literal point of view, they they set it up, and this was the nursery, then it was a playroom, and she says it was a gym of some kind, and she knows this because the windows are barred. And there are some rings or, or things like that on the walls. That sure could be a gym of some kind, but... Sounds like a prison. 
if you take it entirely <laughs> on the surface, it could have been some kind of prison. Yeah. And there's like gouges in the floor and the and the the bed is nailed to the ground. Yeah. It reminded me a little bit of that um the crazy first wife being locked in the attic in Jane Eyre. Oh right. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah. Or or the wife locked out of sight in the color out of space when she gets sick. Yes. She, there's nicer rooms downstairs that she would prefer. Mm hmm. To stay in. But their reasoning is you need a lot of air, and this room is really big and spacious. It's almost an entire floor, so you'll get, you know, you'll get a lot of air up here. Yeah, yeah all this stuff seems so hokey to me that I, that's why I kept thinking, okay, this is BS. They're totally putting her in the attic, you know, putting her away so that they can yeah. go off and do whatever naughty stuff they want to do. Well, he's very, there's a, uh, a sentence, a really revealing line where she says, he is very careful and loving and hardly lets me stir without special direction. <laughs> Which... It's that abusive thing almost where um, when dominance is either perceived as or represented as caring, mm -hmm. but it's not caring. It's dominance. It's yeah. a different thing. But but the the hostage, so to speak, kind of believes it to be, oh, this person cares for me so much that they just don't want me to get hurt. So I can't do this or that or whatever. It actually reminded me of uh, my favorite example of that in modern literature is in the movie Waiting for Guffman, uh, <laughs> which is when Catherine O'Hara's character says, right about her husband Fred Willard she says he's teaching me to change my instincts or at least to ignore them <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> right you know what I'm talking about yeah I know I exactly what you're talking so about yeah. well anyhow so she she moves on after describing the rings on the walls and the, mm -hmm. the playroom setting and stuff to actually describe the the wallpaper in the, room. the paint and paper look as if a boys school had used it it is stripped off the paper in great patches all around the head of my bed, about as far as I can reach, and in a great place on the other side of the room low down. I never saw a worse paper in my life. One of those sprawling, flamboyant patterns committing every artistic sin. It is dull enough to confuse the eye in following, pronounced enough to constantly irritate and provoke study. And when you follow the lame, uncertain curves for a little distance, they suddenly commit suicide plunge off at outrageous angles, destroy themselves in unheard-of contradictions. The color is repellent, almost revolting, a smoldering, unclean yellow, strangely faded by the slow-turning sunlight. It is a dull, yet lurid orange in some places, a sickly sulfur tint in others. No wonder the children hated it. I should hate it myself if I had to live in this room long. There comes John, and I must put this away. He hates to have me write a word. And that's the first break in the narrative. And then the story picks up about two weeks later, it says. At this point in the story, she we know that she's suffering from a depression of some kind, and that she has had a baby, because she says Mary is so good with the baby, which... Yeah, that's the character I was confused about. I don't know who that is. Yeah, and then she's never brought up again in the story. So yeah. that's the only time that she's brought up is to say... Because I thought, oh, Mary's... Maybe Mary's the nanny and he's sleeping with the nanny and that's what's going right. on but again that didn't pay out <laughs> no <laughs> i don't know why i keep but, pushing that and but that was what was going through my head when i was reading this well when i was talking to heather about the story before you know when we were trying to decide which part she wanted to read she was like man that first solid section i thought he was having an affair with somebody okay good it's not just me so she's suffering from a depression mm -hmm. obviously postpartum depression right. and at this point and and reading the story further on it it sounds like it's postpartum psychosis it's not it's it's beyond just your typical depression yeah which is a, a real thing that happens to lots and lots of women after they have uh, have children and yeah. it's horrible thinking about this is how people dealt with it a hundred years ago Oh, my God. Yeah, it's very real. And it's certainly not to be treated with isolation and condescension. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, uh, there were parts where I kind of this sounds terrible. I kind of empathize, empathize with John. OK, just when he, he's like everything. <laughs> she's like, I hate this wallpaper. And he's like, you know what? I'm you're such a blessed little goose. You know what? We're going to strip this down. We're going to take care of the stuff. We're going to get it looking really nice in here. <laughs> he's a total lazy, lazy husband. He's like, you know what? Um, you getting fixated on this is a bad idea. I think we should just leave it how it is, because if we move it all around, it's just going to make things worse for you. But I feel like he looked at what kind of project that was going to be and just went, <laughs> yeah, oh, man, I don't want to do that. And so he came up with good reasons why they shouldn't. Why do they shouldn't. You know? yeah. <laughs> he certainly gets less sympathetic. He's telling her, don't give way to fantasies. He like demonizes her imaginative, imaginative power. Yeah. That section there. Because she makes reference to, it would be nice to have advice and companionship about my work. 
led me to believe that she's actually a, a writer in her life. He, and maybe that's why they don't want her writing. Yeah, I didn't I didn't pick that up initially. But after I read about some of the background of the story, which we'll talk about afterwards, it, yeah. I, I think that makes sense. So she's left to not do anything but study that terrible wallpaper. And uh, it looks like eyes are, are staring at you kind of. Yeah, she the, the 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 way the pattern is in the in the wallpaper that kind of does curly shapes and things like that. But within those curls, mm-hmm. she feels like that those make eyes and that the eyes are at different angles. But then she also like uh, throughout the story, she sort of tries to follow the pattern from one corner yeah. of the room to the other and just kind of gets lost in it and decide and gets frustrated and goes back to it. I mean, I'm like, oh my god, I can't believe she's. I mean, this is what's going on. This is how she's occupying herself by doing these crazy, crazy things. Yeah. Well, if you've ever been late, which I haven't, but I mean, I'm talking to people who've been laid up for a long time because they were very ill or I mean, you do start to focus on just little things, the counting ceiling tiles or whatever. Yeah. She, again, has to curtail her writing because John's coming and she's keeping it secret from him. Well, that's when he's, she has to, their sister on, that's when she has to cut it off because the sister's coming up the stairs. Oh, right? right. Yes. Yeah. And that's, and that's where we get Jenny. Jenny is John's sister, which kind of makes her a bit creepier to me because she's aligned with him. But there's a condescending way that even uh, our protagonist talks about her. Oh, right. That she's that this is kind of the line of work that she's going to be doing for the rest of her life because she's kind of a simple person. She has no hopes for a better profession than to be a housekeeper. I verily believe she thinks it is the writing which made me sick. In other words, she's not intellectual. She's scared of that because it's intellectual. Oh, right. Now, when the writing, that's and now it all is making sense. That's why they don't want her to write in her journal, because writing, if she's a yeah. writer, is work for her. And that's exactly that's OK. And it's all becoming clear to me now. I'm glad we're we're having this discussion, Chad. <laughs> well, some relations come and go since we last heard from her when she's writing in this next sec- section. It's in the summer. The 4th of July is over. Yeah. She had some people that she wanted to come earlier that she had mentioned that they said maybe, you know, cousin Henry and Julia might come down. And yeah, but he's saying, no, that'd be too much for you. We can't have them down. There's this heartbreaking sentence she writes in this section where she says, I cry at nothing and cry most of the time. Ugh. I feel so bad for her. And they're saying summer's going pretty fast and she's not getting any better. Now, I don't know what better looks like for them. Yeah. The husband says if she's not better by fall, they're going to send her to Weir Mitchell, which is a reference to an actual doctor. Oh, right. It is. Yeah. I didn't I didn't realize that that was. Yeah. Well, we'll talk about that at the end of the story. I would never have got that unless I did the reading on Gilman that I did. Yeah. And left alone much of the time, she continues to focus on the pattern. It says, I lie here on this great immovable bed. It is nailed down, I believe. And follow that pattern about by the hour. It is as good as gymnastics, I assure you. I start, we'll say, at the bottom, down in the corner over there where it has not been touched. And I determine for the thousandth time that I will follow that pointless pattern to some sort of a conclusion. I know a little of the principle of design, and I know this thing was not arranged on any laws of radiation, or alternation, or repetition, or symmetry, or anything else that I ever heard of. I just like that because it's very Lovecraftian yeah. in a way. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of... It's non-Euclidean wall. Non-Euclidean wall favor, exactly. She's real despondent in the next section. She's saying, I don't even know why I should write this. You know, you get that she's just... She's getting worse. Yeah. Even more tired. And she says something weird, too, about, like, she mentions the baby again. And that she's glad yeah. that the baby doesn't see or doesn't have to deal with the wallpaper. Yeah. Which is kind of, uh, to me, it's when, what she's saying is it doesn't have to deal with me. Oh, uh, that's insightful. Yeah, that, that does make sense. Because, you know, babies don't care about wallpaper. The end of this section is when you get the first positive idea that she's starting to see things. She says uh, about the wallpaper, she says, Of course, I never mention it to them anymore. I am too wise. But I keep watch of it all the same. There are things in that paper that nobody knows but me. Or ever will. Behind that outside pattern, the dim shapes get clearer every day. It is always the same shape, only very numerous. And it is like a woman stooping down and creeping about behind that pattern. I don't like it a bit. I wonder, I I begin to think, I wish John would take me away from here. She's seeing this woman in there. The woman creeping about. The next section, things get a little worse, um... You know, John's sleeping a lot of the times when she just keeps very still and stays awake and watches the pattern in the moonlight on that wallpaper. In fact, it says, I watched the moonlight on that undulating wallpaper till I felt creepy. (laughs) And then, uh, right, and that's when she sees the faint figure behind starts to shake the pattern as if it wanted to get out. 
Yeah, I, that was hard for me to visualize when I when I was thinking about that in the story. Where is it like a, you would shake a cage? You know, like would it move that way, or is it a, kind of a slight vibration or a ripple? Or I don't know. Even in the obtuse way of saying that, it made it even more creepy to me because I couldn't wrap my head around it. Well, she's complaining about the craziness of the pattern in the daylight. It's in the moonlight that she really sees that it's becoming bars, and that she she's sure there's this woman trapped behind there. And here's here's where the unreliable narrator thing. Yeah. Yeah, she because she's getting really suspicious and and thinking exactly. that her husband is in on it, and that so and, and Jenny is as well that they're doing something. They're kind of trying to drive her crazy, or they're trying to destroy her, or or get her caught by this woman. It it she's not exactly sure what they're trying to do, but they're doing something. Yeah, there was a connection I made here that I didn't make before that really really bothered me when Jenny she catches Jenny touching the wallpaper. Mm-hmm. Like Jenny thinks she's taking a nap or something, and Jenny's looking at it and when she says hey what are you doing Jenny turns around like she got caught doing something wrong yeah and Jenny says well the yellow from the paper is coming off on your clothes your husband's clothes and she uses the word in in smooches she says it's coming off and these there's smooches of it on your clothes smooches just means a smudge I found that word choice to be interesting because of something later okay so I just wanted to mention that now okay okay I don't know but that little encounter is what you get there and then the next section is very short but a change has happened the narrator says life is very much more exciting now than it used to be. She's entered into this delusion far enough that it's actually cured her depression in a way. <laughs> She's because they didn't have her let her, didn't let her have any stimulus. They didn't let her do right. anything that would be engaging. She's found something to get herself engaged in. You know right. what I mean? But it's and, it's her psychosis. It's not like a depression anymore. It's it's moved to a full blown psychosis. Yeah. And she's formulating some kind of crazy plan that's given her a sense of purpose. I was even thinking it's kind of like people that get into a sensory deprivation tank. All stimulus is taken away from you. Pretty soon you'll start to hallucinate. Isn't that what they say happens? I've never been in a sensory deprivation tank, so I couldn't tell you. Me neither. So I'm going to say that that happens to absolutely anybody who's ever done it. Yes. <laughs> well, she reveals she's got about a week to go before she can get done with ever, whatever crazy business she's planning. Right. Yeah. And then she t- talks about the, the smell of the wallpaper. The smell detail is great. It makes me think of all the yellow things I ever saw. Not beautiful ones like buttercups. But old, foul, bad yellow things. Well, because, I mean, people, when they die, when people die, you you go yellow. Like, you don't mm-hmm. go gray, like, in zombie movies and things like that. And I like how she even says she'll be outside and then she'll turn her head to surprise it. And there it is. Like, the <laughs> smell is creeping up behind her all the time. And then she mentions this mark, and this is what I was talking about. Then she mentions this mark on the wall, low down, that uh-huh. runs around the room. And she calls it a long, straight, even smooch. It started making me think, has she already been creeping around the room? Yeah. I mean, is she the one responsible for that long smooch? Yeah. And and if she is, isn't that why Jenny was looking at the paper? Because there's all of this residue on her clothes from her just crawling around the room. So it's been going on. Way to spoil the ending of the story. (laughs) Come on, we're almost there. (laughs) Yeah, I know, I know. That's what I took away from it. I just something it's a little detail I hadn't catched before. I didn't catch that. I'm glad you pointed that out. The next few entries are shorter and start rising to kind of a fever pitch. She's discovered that the pattern on the wallpaper moves because the woman behind is shaking it. Yeah. And there might actually be a great many women behind it. Yeah. And during the day, she starts seeing the woman creeping around outside. So yeah, she's not just confined to the wallpaper, she's out and about in the world. It's only at night when she's when she's locked into the wallpaper. It, it, which actually, when she has that realization, it gives way to one of my favorite lines in the story where it says, It is the same woman, I know, for she is always creeping. And most women do not creep by daylight. <laughs> <laughs> what does that mean? True statement. Most women do not creep by daylight. Most women don't. How many women do you know that creep by daylight? I don't know any, but exactly. I've never had my, anybody exactly. that way before. True statement. <laughs> Uh, she, she's even getting antagonistic with her, her husband and Jenny. Yeah, because she wants to peel away the wallpaper. And John is beginning to notice, and, and she doesn't like the look in his eyes. And she's heard him talking to Jenny, asking a lot of professional questions about me. <laughs> that's, that's a great, great line. That's a great scene. She goes, I heard him ask Jenny a lot of professional questions about me. She had a very good report to give. And it's just so like, ah, <laughs> oh, what a great line. <laughs> Well, let's let's move this to the end, just because you've already okay. given it away. And uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Basically, she concocts this crazy plan where she's got a rope, and she's where, where she got this rope. We don't know, but she's got a rope, right. and she's going to try and catch this woman. Because time is winding down. This is actually their last day yeah. in the house, and then they're going to go. So they've actually moved all of the furniture out of the room. It's just the bed that's been still nailed, nailed to the floor. Yeah. And the wallpaper. I think John had to go off on business mm-hmm. for the, day. the night before. Yeah. So while, while he was gone, she peeled as much of it away as she, she could. And, right. and when Jenny came up and saw that, she was like, 
well, you know what? It is pretty ugly wallpaper. Go ahead if you want to. <laughs> right. Yeah. And she locks the door to the room and she tosses the key out the window. Is yes. that what you're driving at? Yes, exactly. John gets back and is mm. banging on the door and says, you know, uh, let, let me in, dear. Let me in. And she's and she's hasn't caught the woman yet. But there's something quick and subtle here that happens where she moves from observer to observed. She talks about tying the woman up if she tries to escape. Yeah. And then she starts talking about the escape herself. Yeah, that she's, she's like escaping. Becoming the woman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can hear it happen in this, in this last section of the story. Then I peeled off all the paper I could reach standing on the floor. It sticks horribly and the pattern just enjoys it. All those strangled heads and bulbous eyes and waddling fungus growths just shriek with derision. I am getting angry enough to do something desperate. To jump out of the window would be admirable exercise, but the bars are too strong even to try. Besides, I wouldn't do it. Of course not. I know well enough that a step like that is improper and might be misconstrued. I don't like to look out of the windows even. There are so many of those creeping women and they creep so fast. I wonder if they all come out of that wallpaper as I did. But I am securely fastened now by my well-hidden rope. You don't get me out in the road there. I suppose I shall have to get back behind the pattern when it comes night, and that is hard. It is so pleasant to be out in this great room and creep around as I please. I don't want to go outside. I won't, even if Jenny asks me to. For outside you have to creep on the ground, and everything is green instead of yellow. But here, I can creep smoothly on the floor, and my shoulder just fits in that long smooch around the wall, so I cannot lose my way. Why, there's John at the door. It is no use, young man. You can't open it. <laughs> How he does call and pound. Now he's crying for an axe. It would be a shame to break down that beautiful door. John, dear said I in the gentlest voice. The key is down by the front steps under a plantain leaf. That silenced him for a few moments. Then he said, very quietly indeed, Open the door, my darling. I can't, said I. The key is down by the front door under a plantain leaf. And then I said it again, several times, very gently and slowly and said it so often that he had to go and see. And he got it, of course, and came in. He stopped short by the door. What is the matter? He cried. For God's sake, what are you doing? I kept on creeping just the same, but I looked at him over my shoulder. I've got out at last, said I, in spite of you and Jane, and I've pulled off most of the paper, so you can't put me back. Now why should that man have fainted? But he did, and right across my path by the wall, so that I had to creep over him every time. And that is the end. That, man, that is a weird... Why did he faint? Was it just because she got crazy eyes? or uh, did? And then I thought maybe she was actually creeping on the wall, as in her feet were on the wall, like she was a spider crawling around the edge of the wall. Oh, wow. I, I don't know. I, it, does, it doesn't say that specifically, but, I mean, if he fainted, it's got to be something pretty intense. Well, I mean, he might just be that she's just on the floor creeping around against the wallpaper. He's been seeing her doing nothing but laying in bed for the entire summer. When Lovecraft in Supernatural Horror and Literature, the other time that he mentions this outside of the introduction, uh -huh. he says, Charlotte Perkins Gilman and the yellow wallpaper rises to a classic level in subtly delineating the madness which crawls over a woman dwelling in the hideously papered room where a madwoman was once confined. Oh. And when I read that, I was like, where, mad woman was once confined? Where is he getting that? Like, I never thought that. No, I never. And then I thought, okay, well, he's actually taking it absolutely literally as a ghost story. And I'd never read it that way before, but if you do, the clues are there. Yeah, there is the, the barred window, and then there are the rings that were on the wall that mm -hmm. she talks about. In the book. So somebody w could have been held there. And the house, nobody wants it, and there's some kind of problem with the who's willing the house to whom. There's been some kind of... I mean, it, it right. all sounds like if you were to take that on the surface level, it would work. I was a little surprised that that's what he had to say about it, though. The, the fact that I mean, a lot of the things that I've, I've read about it, too, is it, it is about her dealing with her own postpartum depression like this actually happened to her and then that doctor that name that you that pointed right. out earlier he 
was her doctor and told her to do these things. And she thought it was yeah. stupid, but she did it for a while and it didn't work mm -hmm. and it made her worse. And then she stopped doing it and everything got better. She kind of never forgave that guy and thought he was a horrible doctor, which she was probably very typical at the time to be dealing with this type of thing. So Lovecraft is not really that far removed from this time. Yeah, yeah. So he he wouldn't really have any understanding of postpartum depression or or anything like that. See what that, that's what the story is really about and how she was being put down by her husband who was not giving her what she needed. And as the doctor who was not giving her what she needed. And mm -hmm. and it's her kind of working through that in this story. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that is what I always... And I, when we read it in college or high school, actually, I don't even remember when I had to cover it. I didn't realize there was a real story behind it, or maybe I didn't know that then. But until I read this again, I didn't realize Gilman was, you know, laid up for three months just like this. And yeah. this Dr. Weir Mitchell gave her the same advice. But we had always looked at it as in the woman behind the wallpaper represents her being held, you know, kind of behind bars. Yeah. The feminist by a misogynist thing. culture and and that you know at the end when he falls over and she continues to creep around and like climbs over him that's sort of her her Vic victory yeah. over him right that's how i always read it so it actually really surprised me to hear him say that about the story but it was before i reread it for this so i really looked for why would he think that uh-huh and the clues are there if you want them to be this could just work as a haunted house story Oh, yeah, definitely. It really, it really does. I didn't know this stuff about her personally or the postpartum depression stuff, mm -hmm. except I'm, I'm familiar with it. And when she just had a baby and they were putting her up and she was depressed, I, I go, oh, she's suffering from postpartum depression. But yeah. I didn't know that Gilman had suffered the same thing. And that was until after the fact that I read that. And she talked about that. Before she yeah. died, she, that's how we know that this is what this is about. Oh, no, Gilman said that she wrote it specifically so this guy would read it and stop treating people that way. Yeah. But, of course, he didn't. He didn't. And, and she wound up committing suicide, I believe, when she was a lot older. Yeah, but she was suffering from a terminal disease. Uh, and oh, was killed she? Her, yeah, and killed herself. She was a big oh, okay. proponent of uh, right to death type of Oh, type okay. Of thing. Well, that's yeah. a little less it, sad, I guess. It, it wasn't, um, yeah, it wasn't because she uh, just was depressed. It was because she was, I, I think it was cancer. She was diagnosed <laughs> and, and she was going to die soon and she just didn't want to suffer through it and yeah, killed herself. yeah. Oh. It was an overdose of chloroform. Well, I, I I think you would be doing yourself a disadvantage if you did just take it as a ghost story, because it's obviously about a heck of a lot more. Yeah. It was meant to be about a heck of a lot more. But it was interesting that it it did work as a strict weird tale. And you know what it really, I think the Lovecraft work that it must have influenced the most, or at least it's the one that shares the most common elements, is the rats in the walls. In that you have the fellow moving into that ancestral home, oh, okay. becoming somewhat obsessed with the tapestries and yeah. things, yeah. mostly with the sounds within the house. But then he slowly peels back the layers of his own story yeah. by descending into the depths of the house, and eventually he becomes the the monster, right? Yeah. At the, at the very end, he becomes a cannibal. So it's like it's the same kind of thing where there's that switch at the end where she went into the wallpaper and became the woman in the wallpaper. I just thought it was. I thought it was similar. It might have been in, working in his head a little bit when he was writing that one. See, I thought it had more similarity to the white ship. To the white ship, did you? Because <laughs> it's got, because this is a yellow wallpaper. And exactly, that's a white ship. I got it. Yeah, it was a color in the title of the story. A yes. color in an object. <laughs> There's a lot to talk about in yeah. here. Yeah, it's a really really cool story, and it's got a lot of great levels to it, and I recommend it. Well, uh, with that, I think we should ramp up this week's episode. I, I do also yeah. want to say my Kickstarter's still going, and as of this recording, it's not quite there yet. We're about five hundred dollars shy still. So please. Uh, go to my Kickstarter for my graphic novel, Trans Reality. It's a science fiction story with transhumanism and post-singularity stuff, if you're into that kind of thing. It's uh, got people that swap bodies and copy their brains and do all types of fun things like that. So mm. go check out the Kickstarter site. There's a video that explains more, and there's some images from the book, and it's uh, totally fun. So please go out there and support it. Check that out, everybody. Make sure it gets funded. And uh, next on the show, we will be covering for our premium subscribers the story the monkey's paw yeah which is a great story a great i'm really story. looking forward to that one. Oh, i want to thank our, our reader as well uh heather clinky yeah heather you did a great job thanks so much yes. for doing this and, nice and uh, creepy with that i'm chris lackey i'm chad pfeiffer and you've been listening to the hp lovecraft literary podcast at hppodcraft.com we'll be at you next week hppodcraft.com <laughs>